And we are back. This is episode number 70 of Calibrated with Scott. I'm Scott, of course. Today, I'm joined by the one, the only, Brian Berletic. Brian, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me back. Yeah, no problem. Uh, actually, before we get started, can you tell people where to find you at the beginning of the video instead of the at the end? Because people know who you are, but let's let's give them your information. Okay, so you can find me by going onto YouTube, typing in the new Atlas, should be the first one that pops up. And in the video description of every single video are all the other places you can find and follow my work, which includes Telegram. I highly suggest people follow me on Telegram because that's where I can post everything unfiltered, articles, entire videos get posted there. You could watch them on Telegram instead of YouTube if you prefer, and you will not miss anything at all. So uh, I would I would suggest doing it that way. Yeah, and make sure you guys go follow Brian. He posts quality content very regularly. He's a great source of information. Uh, and uh, without further ado, let's just get right into it. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, I would like to start with, uh, let, let's just start with the counteroffensive. Let's talk about how it's going. Uh, not a lot has happened since the last time we've talked. Um, and uh, I, let me just get your thoughts on it. Where, How do you think it's going? Where do you think it's going? Uh, take it away. Well, we, we've been told that the Ukrainians have made this major breakthrough and that it was a turning point for the offensive, which is now, I think, almost four full months of fighting. Uh, began beginning of June, and now we're almost into October. So we heard that, I think that was about two weeks ago, maybe. And then ever since then, we keep hearing, oh, they've, they've broken through at Robotino, Verbove. But, but these are the same places that they claim they've already broken through. So actually what's happening is there's fighting over these two villages. Or uh, this, I mean, they're, they're very small, uh, almost not fair to call them villages. There's fighting in and around them. Uh, Scott, you were showing me this topographical map before we got started. I think a lot of people following the fighting there have looked at this map, and they can see that the Ukrainians are being channeled into low-lying grounds, and they're just being shelled by the Russians. And the you know the one thing that we continuously heard was that it doesn't matter. The Ukrainians have an artillery advantage over the Russians. This is attritional fighting, which favors the Ukrainians. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, and even the Western media is starting to talk about this. I was just reading a New York Times article the other day talking about who gained the most territory this year. And it turns out the final conclusion is Russia did. So in the middle of this huge Ukrainian offensive that has been going on for now almost four full months, uh, you know, starting to approach half a year of fighting, Russia has actually gained more territory during this this fighting. And that's mainly in the, the Northeast around Kopyansk. And I want to point out that that territory that Russia is taking right now, that, that is territory that Ukraine took last year during their fall offensive. Now it is essentially being reversed. So the, offen the offensive, I would say it has culminated. They may be trying to scrape together forces to do another major assault, but these are not even the forces that were allotted for this offensive. They're just scraping anything together that they can find. Uh, there's heavy fighting around Bakhmut, even though we, we heard that the West told Ukraine to abandon that and commit all of their available forces to the, the offensive in the South. It doesn't seem like they did that, or if they did in a very limited way. So the offensive is, it's, it's basically culminated. You could even say that it is over but they don't want to admit that. They will never admit that. So they're claiming that this is just going to be a long, a long-term process with no ending, a forever offensive, because they will not admit that it's that it has failed. So you have an objective. The objective was to reach the, the coast of the Sea of Azov. That obviously is not happening. So then it is a failure. And they will just depict all the fighting, any fighting that takes place from this point forward as part of an ongoing forever offensive. Yeah, and I was actually uh, looking at the populations of the towns that have been captured, and it totals, I mean, in, I think, 2002 or three is when the last census was done for these towns. Uh, and they that's when Ukraine had 48 million people, which it doesn't anymore. Uh, and these 
whole in totality the all of the towns in Bakhmut and in Zaporozhia and southern Donetsk that have been captured by Ukraine amount to 5,000 people which is half of what Solidar was and you remember the Russians captured Solidar and Bakhmut so that's two huge cities that were captured in the last Russian offensive offensive and uh you know the Ukrainians haven't even gotten close to that. And like you said, in terms of territory, the Russians have captured almost twice as much territory this calendar year than the Ukrainians have. So that's something to, you know, be looking at when you're talking about how successful this offensive was. And, you know, the Russian uh, offensive around Bakhmut wasn't even a territorial conquest. It was a operation to buy time for the Russian mobilization and uh, wear down the Ukrainian units around Bakhmut. The Ukrainian offensive had a very openly stated goal, which was to reach Crimea, right? To reach the Sea of Azov, to cut the land bridge. That hasn't been accomplished. I think that would qualify and quantify this as a failure. Um, another thing that I was talking about, or I was going to talk about, was the... Oh, I don't even think I can remember anymore. But uh, you had mentioned Kupiansk, where the Russians had been pushing uh, a couple weeks ago. They, ha you know, they crossed uh, the one of the rivers up there, uh, not the Oskal, but the one further east, and had, uh, cre you know, they established a bridgehead, which they still have. Uh, and then we saw things sort of settle down. Uh, you know, there was a much talked about Russian offensive in that region, but it never ended up happening, uh, or it hasn't happened yet. Uh, but over the past week, we have seen uh, seven different bridges. Uh, all of the actual established bridges have been destroyed across the Oskal River, uh, which if you guys, if it, you know, everybody listening remembers, the Ukrainians had pushed past the Oskal during their Kharkov offensive and pushed into the LPR, uh, where they were then stopped. And now they've been kind of stuck on this bridgehead for uh, the past year, actually now. Um, and the Russians are now hitting the bridges, which are their supply lines, and they're also striking the pontoon bridges. Uh, do you think we will see a Russian operation before the muddy season begins? Uh, or do you think we're going to see a uh, maybe a winter operation? Or do, are we going to see any operation at all? That That's very difficult to say. But just judging on what Russia has been doing up until now, Cutting, cutting these bridges and isolating, to an extent, the Ukrainian forces uh, east of the Oskol River, this, this would be a perfect, uh, this would be setting the stage perfectly for another one of these attritional grinding operations where now they've isolated them, they've made it much more difficult for them to be resupplied. They'll either have to pull out on their own, which will make it easier for Russian forces to advance, or they'll just be ground down where they are. And either way, it spares Russia from having to do the type of offensive that Ukraine is attempting to conduct uh, all along the line of contact. Because uh, a lot of people are talking about a some sort of coming big arrow Russian offensive. If they were to do any sort of big arrow offensive, it would be costly in, in manpower and equipment. And I don't they could do it. It could be successful, but they will lose a lot of manpower and a lot of equipment. And I think they don't want to do that if they can help it. So they will they will commit to these types of grinding operations. They will try to refine this process to make it as efficient as possible. They will try to use the, the local geography to make it as efficient as possible. So I think that if I had to guess, if I had to choose what I thought they were doing, I would say they are they're setting the stage for another attritional operation around Kopyansk. I don't think they're in a huge hurry to storm it and take it. I think that, that that's much more involved than I think a lot of people might realize. Yeah, uh, I think that people need to start getting their, wrapping their minds around 2024 into 2025, because I think that's how the Russians are thinking about this conflict. They're going to do what they need to do uh, over however long they need to do it to achieve what they need to achieve. And just like you said, uh, these offensives are costly. You know, you talked about the forever counteroffensive down in the south that, you know, started as a spring, was delayed till summer, ran all through the summer, through the fall, and now is, is probably going to head into the winter if they can sustain it. Uh, and why would the Russians do exactly what the Ukrainians just did? 
right? There's always a chance exactly. that it fails, which would be a major setback for the Russian military effort in Ukraine. And there's this, I mean, if your enemy is expending themselves on your best fortifications and, you know, treating themselves naturally through offensive operations, when they really don't have the, you know, the uh, leeway to be doing that with their resources, uh, why stop them? Why force them to go defensive? Why not allow them to keep exposing themselves? And why would you put yourself in a position where you expose yourself unnecessarily? There will be, I, I always say, there will be times for big arrow offensives when there's nobody left defending, right? When there's no armored vehicles, there's no barrels left, there's no artillery shells to be fired. That's when you can start doing big arrow offenses and be hyper successful with them. Uh, up until that point, why take the unnecessary risk, especially when you have a Ukraine that is backed by NATO intelligence, uh, which will basically tell them exactly where you're coming from and what time you're coming at them, you know? So it, I, I fully agree that the Russians are going to take this slow. I do think that there might be uh, some significant pressure on that eastern side of the Oskol, uh, just because once those supply lines are cut, uh, that pressure is going to be much less uh, risk involved. And will i think be more successful uh I, I i don't know if the ukrainians have the uh willpower to retreat and you know sacrifice space for time uh but we'll, we'll see um i wanted to ask you uh about about the weapon situation um because we have seen uh poland who you know they're coming into an election cycle and the the U.S. is coming into that same sort of election cycle that Poland is coming into. Uh, and we've seen statements from the Polish president saying things along the lines of, you know, the weapons are not going to be moved into Ukraine anymore. And, uh, you know, the way I see that, it's, it's a political move, right? The weapons are still going to be coming into Ukraine. I don't think the Polish can stop what they're doing right now. It's, it's you know, it's the only way. That they're going to be able to succeed uh, in what in what they've invested in, but it's very interesting and telling to me that the popular political decision is to say we're not sending things to Ukraine, right? I I think that that is is something that a lot of people kind of miss is that yes, while it might still be happening, the popular thing to say to the Polish people is we are not going to be supplying Ukraine with weapons. Uh, do you see that extending into the 2024 U.S. presidential elections? And do you see uh, this sort of uh, zeitgeist, I guess, around sending weapons to Ukraine changing uh, in the way that it has sort of changed in Poland, that becoming more of the actual policy? Well, that, that's an interesting take as to why why they're saying saying this that they're not going to supply Ukraine with weapons anymore because it, it's a popular sentiment in in Poland now yeah and that that is because this is what happens to all of uh, U.S. NATO engineered proxy wars they are backing the the worst people imaginable in any targeted country and eventually people are going to wake up to the reality of what's really happening versus what they were told is happening. Now, I think there's another aspect taking place in Poland there. They don't have that many weapons and ammunition left to give Ukraine in the first place. So maybe this is a way of uh, resolving two situations with one solution. They they say this uh, and it absolves them from emptying absolutely everything in their inventories, the newer weapons that they're now acquiring for their own military. And it also allows them to placate the, the population to a degree, although they'll still be compelled to sell, send anything that they do have to spare to Ukraine and other forms of support. Remember, all, all of Ukraine's damaged weapons and vehicles get sent to Poland to be repaired and then sent back. So that that is a massive element of this ongoing proxy war that, that that Poland is playing a part in that they will continue doing if if they shut that down then I'll then I'll say something uh, very large is happening politically in Poland but until then I think it's mostly because they're they're out of weapons and yeah. ammunition to send now regarding the situation in the United States a lot of these people this your observation might be uh, much more on target with the United States. A lot of these people 
in Washington are quite okay waging wars abroad. They're quite okay waging a, a proxy war with Russia. A lot of them, if you even listen to them, right after they say, let's stop this proxy war in Ukraine, the next the next part of the sentence is so that we can wage war on on China yeah. instead. So these these people are are dedicated warmongers. They're just having a, a dispute over who they should be waging war against at the moment. And some people say both. Some say let's finish Russia. Others say let's move on to China. Uh, obviously, for America's best interest, the people living in America, their best interests are served by all of these wars being promptly ended and a complete readjustment of American foreign policy. But we know that that's not going to happen, yeah. no matter who who's elected. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and speaking of, uh, you know, the way that the U.S. is looking at Ukraine, uh, we recently saw Zelensky take a trip and speak at the U.N. Uh, he also made a trip to Washington, where he uh, spoke with Biden and had a meeting with Biden. And then he went to Canada where he had a very interesting parliamentary session that I would like to talk about. Um, but let's start at the UN and this this UN trip. <clears throat> there was a, it seemed lackluster. It, it just seemed very different from when he went last year, right? Right after the Kharkov and Kherson uh, situations had unfolded in Ukraine, uh, benefiting Ukraine, uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, vigor around the the ukraine project we need to get them what they need they're beating the russians the russians are on the back foot this is our time to strike you know really send the support that the ukrainians need this time it seemed like everybody was keeping their distance uh nobody was making any commitments uh Zelensky did not look happy Zelensky's uh you know cabinet that was there with him did not look very impressed uh, even uh, the they they even used uh, Zelensky in the crowd clapping for himself on stage because uh, I don't think the actual scenes were as uh, good for propaganda as the Ukrainians would have liked. So there was a lot of uh, very sketchy stuff there. Then he went and talked with Biden, where uh, basically nothing came out of that. We had some rumors of ATACMs being sent. We had some soft commitments for ATACMs being sent. But uh, even to this day, about a week later, we have had no confirmation on ATACMs being sent. And in fact, the Germans are now starting starting to sort of backtrack on the Taurus missile uh, that they, that was talked about being sent. And ATACMs is basically kind of been downplayed, I think, by a lot of the media outlets. We're not hearing much about it at all. Um, and then <laughs> to Canada, where uh, in the parliament, uh, they, they, including uh, Zelensky, gave a standing, a standing ovation to a 98-year-old uh, Waffen-SS uh, veteran. Volunteer. Vo volunteer, I guess. You know, he, he was just conscripted. He didn't have a choice. Uh, and he was received a standing ovation for fighting the Russians, which if you know anything about history, you should know instantly that if you're cheering for a Ukrainian who fought against the Russians during World War II, that individual is a Nazi. Uh, so that that is a, uh, you know, a first red flag that I think most people should have known, which, you know, I, I made a post about this on Twitter. I said, uh, what, what I don't I don't understand what's worse. Did they give a did they openly give a standing ovation to a Nazi or did they unknowingly stand up and cheer for somebody when they don't even understand basic history? I mean, how many Canadians died in World War II to the Nazi fighting the Nazis? And now you're giving a standing ovation. So I would like to hear your thoughts about the U.N., the Biden, Biden meeting and then that parliamentary visit. OK, a lot, of, uh, a lot to cover here with the, yeah. the U.N., I think it's I think it's a combination of things. If, if you remember in the beginning, February 2022 onward, it was it was like a trend. It was uh, it was a fad. Being pro-Ukrainian, getting out your Ukrainian flag, putting it in your profile. That was the cool thing to do. But a after all of this time, there's other things going on. People are bored with it. There's no more enthusiasm. Plus, the reality of the situation in Ukraine, even if you you are still supporting Ukraine, but you're looking at what's going on, 
Ukraine is losing. The Western media admits Ukraine is losing. The Western media is beginning to admit that there really is no way for Ukraine to win. And if you're a, a leader of another country that is not directly involved in this proxy war, well, we saw a lot of those countries were trying to remain neutral. They did not want to get dragged into this. A lot of them supported uh, Russia openly or uh, you know, maybe not so openly. Others began pivoting one by one toward, toward Russia, China, BRICS, multipolarism as this conflict has ground on. And there were a lot of things that the United States and the European Union did to Russia that served as a catalyst for that. Alexander Mikuras points this out all the time on the Duran on his program as well. The sanctions on Russia other and, and the price cap on uh, Russian hydrocarbons. Other countries looked at this abuse of these monopolies that the West maintains. And they said, if they could do it to Russia today, maybe they'll do it to us tomorrow. So we need to pivot away from this entire architecture and invest in something new where this cannot happen to us, because that is our that is our future. We're, we're, if, if they could do it to a large and powerful country like Russia, we're not, we don't have as much power and leverage. They'll be able to do it to us even easier. And that goes for uh, energy, financial systems, everything, insurance even. This has played out uh, across all of these different uh, I industries and instruments. So I think that's probably why when Ukrainian President Zelensky was in the UN, people are not enthusiastic about it. It's, he's he's losing a proxy war. The veneer has peeled off and people see that their future uh, connected to Ukraine is going off over the cliff with Ukraine. And then Zelensky goes to Washington. He goes to Washington. There was no there was no uh, appearance in front of the U.S. Congress. That was that was prevented from happening. No enthusiasm there anymore. He meets Biden, just as you say, there there really was nothing that came out of it. We heard these ambiguous commitments regarding the attack arms. Like I've pointed out, even if they send the attack arms, even if they send the ones that Ukraine has been asking for, the unitary warhead with the 300 kilometer range, it's not going to change anything for yep. Ukraine yep. in the, the outcome. It's not going to. Just just like the Storm Shadow and Scalp, if Germany sends the, the Taurus and the attack arms are, are sent together, it's not going to make any difference. Uh, so this is this is the U.S. And again, a lot of people are saying they don't want to spend any more money on Ukraine. They have plenty of money to spend on Ukraine. The problem is they have no more weapons to send Ukraine. And the military industrial output of the collective West simply is not up for this type of conflict, sustaining this type of fighting. Uh, so then Zelensky goes to Canada, and Canada is, is a U.S. proxy, a vassal in many ways, and they're willing to they're willing to uh, part with their dignity and, and any semblance of sovereignty, and they're willing to go go through the motions, bring Zelensky into the parliament, let him let him speak, pretending like it's 2022 uh, all over again. I was watching the CBC, the the CBC rerun. Uh, I wasn't watching it live, but they were introducing it like it was a sporting event or like the, the, yeah. a Christmas Day parade or something. It was ridiculous. And then in the middle of you know his speech, you know again all of these recycled platitudes that have no connection to reality. The same goes for the prime minister of uh, Canada. And then the speaker of parliament, the head of the Canadian parliament, is trying to connect what's going on today to World War II. And he did make a, a very relevant connection, I think, uh, because as, as he was talking about Winston Churchill uh, having before appeared in front of the Canadian parliament, just like President Zelensky is now, and then he decides to honor this World War II veteran who he very clearly introduced as a Ukrainian, like you said, a Ukrainian who fought the Russians. And when I heard that, I just, I just, uh, it's such an odd, odd thing to, to, to say. And when you're talking about World War II, it's always they fought the Japanese, or they fought the fascists in Italy, or they fought the Nazis. Yeah. I've never heard anyone talk 
about and celebrating someone who was fighting the Russians during World War II because everyone fighting the Russians in World War II were Nazis. So plain and simple. So he was. He was a he was a Nazi. He was a volunteer for the Waffen SS, the worst of the worst in in the Nazi Germany uh, structure politically and militarily. And he's someone who has been apparently involved in Canadian politics for a very long time. And he appears to be part of a much larger group of known Nazis who were deliberately brought into Canada, along with the U.S. and Europe, as part of this force, this vanguard they wanted to create against the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And this is something that they cultivated, the U.S., and its allies cultivated very deliberately inside Ukraine itself. And when they weren't able to, because of the Soviet Union, uh, Ukraine being part of the Soviet Union, they cultivated this extremism in these communities that had moved to places like Canada. And then they re-exported this extremism back to Ukraine after the fall of the Soviet Union. And it's very similar to what they did with uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda in the Middle East. A lot of these communities were, were, were harbored in the West and then sent back to Syria or sent back to Libya to go fight or or brought into uh, Europe and North America to harbor them so that the Syrian government couldn't eliminate them. So they could be used to fight another day. Same process. And that's who this uh, Nazi World War II veteran, this is the, the cycle, the game that he was a part of. And so it wasn't some innocent accident. This is someone they knew about for a long time. He was politically active, especially in promoting Canada's support for Ukraine throughout the special military operation. That They had to know who he was. And again, introducing him as someone who fought the Russians in World War II. It's unforgivable. <laughs> and yes the, yes, the speaker stepped down, but the entire Canadian government is complicit they're pretending, oh, we didn't know, but they know about Azov, modern day Nazis in Ukraine. They were training them. They know this. It's been in their media, their government funded media in the UK, in the US, in Canada. They all reported on it for years and years when Russia began the special military operation. They whitewashed it. They purged it. They labeled it as Russian propaganda, even though they were the ones who were reporting it. Uh, in the U.S. Congress, they talked about Azov specifically and how they could not be allowed to receive weapons, funding, training because they are Nazis. Uh, so it's, again, more of this veneer falling off and the, the truth of what the West is actually doing in Ukraine coming to light. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it gives a whole new definition of or it gives a whole new meaning to uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. Where you're, you're siding with literal nazis like scott it almost makes me think that russia has a good reason to to be fighting in ukraine all, uh, have literal nazis knowingly supported by the west uh, uh, uh clamoring on their border uh, very reminiscent of world war ii what a what a horrible horrible decision i i don't i don't understand what the thinking was there i mean somebody had to have caught it there's no way you go through all of that work bringing him in there and you didn't have one person say wait wait what that's fighting the russians yeah what, what back then when uh so that that yeah, that's wild and then trudeau's response to it when it, after it was just ridiculous he basically came out and said uh yeah this and that but uh, russian propaganda we can't let's not fall victim to russian propaganda it's like this isn't russian propaganda dude this is this is you, you invited a Nazi and gave him a standing ovation. Twice. And not just two, two, two standing ovations. And not it wasn't some, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think that there's degrees to the Nazi party, right? If you're Volkstrom at the defended Berlin, that's different than being a Waffen SS soldier. I mean, that's those yeah, are yes. those are two and, and they brought the worst of the worst into the parliament. And gave him a standing ovation. I just I find it to be absolutely ridiculous and telling of how dedicated the narrative is behind the Ukraine project. And, and uh, the Gray Zone did some research into his background, and apparently he he was not only a committed Nazi but an unrepentant Nazi. Yeah. 
And and some people asked, why did he feel comfortable going into the parliament, knowing that they were going to celebrate him and he knowing what he had been a part of during World War II? And it's because they were harbored in, in the West after World War II, their anti-Russian sentiment, if, if every other uh, racist genocidal impulse of theirs had to be suppressed, their anti-Russian uh, obsession, that was encouraged. So he he didn't feel as if he had done anything wrong. He felt that he was he was part of this project that has been going on since the end of World War II, and now he's finally getting recognition for it. Yeah, he got a standing ovation for it. So why would yes. he feel abashed by it? Yeah. And uh, and for and for the Canadian prime minister to bring up Russian propaganda, Russia is saying Ukraine has a huge Nazi problem, past and present. And this is evidence of it. Is, is, so he's calling it Russian propaganda, but it turns out the Russians have been telling the truth all along. If you just randomly invite some World War II vet from Ukraine into the Canadian parliament, he turns out to be a Nazi. It's, 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 what are the chances? Do do the crunch the numbers. What are this? How how statistically possible is that? Unless Ukraine had a huge Nazi problem, and it's it's hilarious watching in the information space pro Ukraine supporters trying to defend this. Like, just admit that it was a mistake. That, that you know, actively okay. like it's like you can't do any wrong, and so even when you do some horrible terrible mistake it, it, it's still right somehow oh he was you know this or oh he was that no nope, he was just a nazi and it's i can't believe that people are you know the people that call russians nazis are the ones openly cheering for nazis it's just it's ridiculous and, um, and one, one one well one last thing on this uh topic they can't they can't say that it was a mistake because if they condemn this this nazi and they begin condemning nazism openly then this calls into question all of the other nazism and extremism that they have been covering up or obliquely defending and promoting throughout this uh, since 2014 onward actually really yeah um I wanted to move into an article. I don't know if you have any articles that you'd like to talk about, but I have one uh, here from The Telegraph, and it is uh, talking about uh, how the Russian economy is predicted to grow now uh, due to rising oil prices and uh, lackluster sanction effects on the Russian uh, economy. So, I mean, this is a, a pretty large omission uh, if the Russian economy is now growing. Uh, uh, you know, compared to what it was predicted to grow, uh, that means that your, you know, the Western plans have not worked out the way that they were supposed to in terms of the sanctions. We've even heard, uh, even just before the counteroffensive started, you know, we were still hearing this, uh, you know, the ruble is crashing, uh, the world is coming down, Russia is suffering. Uh, we never saw any proof of that. We never saw any, uh, you know, the ruble did come down a little bit, but we never saw any uh, effects of that, even anecdotally inside of Russia. And uh, I'm just, I, I want to know what you're thinking about this, because to me, this seems like a pretty big omission that, you know, sanctions haven't worked. And I think that that is the, the crux on which this Ukraine project was, uh, you know, re relying on, you know, they were hoping that the Russian economy would collapse and that would force some sort of regime change or something in Russia. That's not happened. The Russian military is getting stronger. The counteroffensive has failed. Uh, you know, the, the the trips are starting to go wrong. It, it just feels like this whole thing is really starting to come down. Do you do you see that as well? How do you see this, uh, I guess, this telegraph omission uh, playing out? Yes, it, it's inevitable. That that's how I see it. It was it was inevitable that they they would have to admit this. The sanctions when they were first rolled out, it, it became a joke because then the EU would roll out a second package. Then they were in the double digits with these packages. I don't even know what number they're on or if they just abandoned all of that. And more than that, not only did these sanctions not not cripple or collapse the Russian economy, it exploded in. The, the European Union's face, it attacked their economies. It undermined their economies. Germany, I believe, is their economy is contracting. It's not yeah. not growing at all. I think it's in uh, it's it's going backwards. So it's already in a recession. Yes. Yeah, so there you go. And 
think about why that is. Is that something that they're going to be able to, you know, soldier on and, and get past? And the answer is no, because they were relying on this cheap energy coming out of Russia by, by pipelines that have been now physically destroyed. Now they're dependent on liquid natural gas from the United States, which will always, always be more expensive than, than gas that could be piped out of Russia into Germany. You could see what the United States was, was attempting to do with the price caps, especially to artificially make Russian energy more expensive so that they could so that they could get Europe to switch over to this liquid natural gas. It just, it just was not viable. We talk about unipolarism versus multipolarism, unipolarism, whereas the U.S. has you know, a monopolies that it can use to preserve its power and to target nations and undermine them, that is dissipating. That is fading away. They don't have the ability to do that anymore. It doesn't mean that they're powerless, but they're, they thought in their minds that they still had the ability to will the, the, the Russian economy into ruins, and it simply didn't happen. This article that you're citing go, co coincides with the New York Times admitting that Russian military production has only increased. Tank production doubled. Uh, Russian ammunition production seven times larger than the West, not not just the U.S. or the U.K., the West altogether, collectively. Uh, two, uh, up to two million rounds of uh, artillery ammunition being made per year. That's what they say. It could be more. It's probably more than that. And as I pointed out many times, that is more than the U.S. and EU combined when, if and when they expand their artillery production by 20 between 2025 and possibly 20 as late as 2028. So this is a huge this is a huge problem. They couldn't they couldn't cripple Russia's economy. Russian military industrial production is increasing. The country is becoming stronger. Not just that, beyond just Russia. Russia's relationship with the rest of the world is changing. Fundamentally, it's changing. And they're they're changing collectively the structures again that the U.S. had monopolized and used to preserve and expand its power. Now these there's alternatives being used that are uh, just more or less isolating the West. The West isn't isolating anyone. They're they're isolating themselves. So it's it was inevitable, and now the West is coming to grips with that. But then what are they going to do upon realizing this? That that is the question. And do you think that Russia could experience some, I mean, almost opposite, uh, Hades, knock it off, sorry, my dog, uh, some sort of opposite conflicting, uh, compared to what the West wanted, the West wanted to ruin, destroyed Russia. Do you think that Russia can come out of this thing stronger than before? I think in a lot of ways, they they are stronger. They are they are stronger than before. Their military certainly is stronger. No, it, it was always a it was always a work in progress. So the Russian military today, as it is, is not just the result of the last uh, year and a half of, of fighting in Ukraine. This was a buildup that Russia undertook go going way back, probably at least at least to 2008, when Georgian forces attacked Russian forces. And Russia's military performed uh, less than less than they expected. They realized there were fundamental problems, and they undertook this massive process of resolving that. And it wasn't just the military, but it was also the industrial base supporting the military. Uh, so, yes, it, it it is stronger. It will continue to get stronger. I I really cannot see what what obstacle would stop Russia from continuing this trend onward into the future? They're working with most of Eurasia. And I don't know if the West has, has checked or not on this recently, but just China alone has a larger population than the G7 combined. They have the largest industrial base on earth. Uh, just Russia and China together, this is a, a civil, civilizational sized society and economy and industrial base. So. It, it it doesn't really seem like there's anything that that will stop this at this point that I can see. And and do you think that relations will ever normalize with Europe after this? Um, obviously, we've seen the 
uh, Russophobia, you know, pretty openly displayed. But do you think that there's ever going to be a rekindling of that uh, relationship? Because it, to me, it feels like they, they, it's it's mutually beneficial, right? Europe is a huge market for. The so I, I think that eventually, I think eventually r- Europe will will be back in the fold. They will they will join the rest of Eurasia and move on into the future. That will inevitably happen, I do believe. You could even see Russia and also China going through uh, extra effort not to burn all sorts of bridges with Europe, and even and even to a certain extent with the United States. They understand that the current circle of interests driving US, European foreign policy, these, these are interests running a very unsustainable system that is eventually going to collapse. Someone else is going to to displace them, take over, and maybe they'll be able to work with them. And if you remember, before uh, all of this came to a head, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was being built. There was a lot of talk of not, not just Germany working closer with Russia, but all of Europe working closely with China as well in becoming a part of the Belt and Road Initiative. China even built Uh, rail connections to connect not just China, but also Southeast Asia to to Europe. And so there there was a lot of hope that even then it would have happened. Europe would have gotten out from under the the shadow of U.S. hegemony cast over them since the end of World War II, and they would finally have an independent foreign policy that served Europeans' best interests rather than Washington's interests at the cost of Europe's uh, best interests. It could happen again. And I think Russia and China are very much of the mind that that they would like to see that happen. And they will they will put in extra efforts to keep that possibility open in the future. However far in the future, I don't know. Yeah. And that, I mean, you're talking decades, right? That's does that seem uh, fair to you? It's hard to say because who would have thought that Saudi Arabia and Iran would have repaired their relations so quickly. Yeah. There's a lot of things that are changing geopolitically at a much faster pace than I ever imagined. So I really couldn't rule anything out. But you have to see the the interests that are in power right now, you have to see them displaced by, by circles of interest who have a constructive vision for, for their countries and their regions uh, within the rest of the world rather than imposing themselves on the rest of the world. This is still a, a mentality that is persistent in Washington, in London, and in Brussels, uh, and, and then, of course, obviously in Paris, Berlin. This is a mindset that they still have not gotten around, and until they do, I don't I don't think it'll be possible. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there will definitely have to be some fundamental shifts in thinking for that to occur and probably some fundamental shifts in leadership. Um, uh, That's all I have on my list. Do you have anything that you wanted to touch on anything going on in Thailand, anything that you wanted to, you know, get out? Well, maybe to go back to the situation in Ukraine, um, the, you know, we were talking about Russia possibly launching an offensive or how, you know, how long is the conflict going to continue that it it seems poised to be a very long war. We have to remember that Russia is systematically degrading multiple Ukrainian capabilities across the board. They're working on degrading Ukrainian air defense, and this is something that they've been very successful at. And if you've followed the conflict from the very beginning up until now, you will realize that there are certain types of air defense that are in such short number that it actually has allowed uh, the Russian uh, military aviation to act more freely, at least along the line of contact. That together with these glide bombs have have allowed them to play a much wider role now than they had been at the beginning of the conflict. So I think we have to keep an eye open for, for all of these processes undergoing uh, that, that Russia is pursuing right now to degrade these different Ukrainian military capabilities. So their you know, artillery, their armor, their air defense, uh, counter battery radar, that's another important one. As those become more and more degraded and as Russia builds up their capabilities, it's going to allow them to do things on the battlefield that they weren't able to do previously. So I, I say no big arrow offensive, and I'm I'm pretty confident that that will be the case 
for for quite a while. But they when they do exert pressure along the line of contact, it is still technically uh, an offensive if they even if they're just inching forward, they may be able to do that more efficiently and quicker as these capabilities are degraded and as Russia continues building up their their capabilities. Do you think Ukraine will receive anything close to what it received last time? I know there your one of your earlier points was that there's not a lot of weapons left to send. Obviously, we've seen them digging through Leopard 1A5s, which are 60-year-old tanks, to send to Ukraine. And the first batch that was sent was returned because it wasn't even operational. Um, do you see any ability for the West to, I, I guess, first off, send what they sent last time in any meaningful uh, you know, numbers? Or uh, do you see them having even the uh, willpower to do it, the, you know, the, the want to do it? It's, it's really hard to say, technically, if they wanted. Uh, the U.S. has plenty of M1 Abrams that they could send. They have more Bradleys. They have more Strikers. They have they have large numbers of, of all of this equipment, but they, they've already sent in certain categories a certain percentage that if they were to do it again and have it all lost on the battlefield again, that would actually start to impact uh, the U.S. military's uh, readiness for any other conflict that they're seeking to provoke around the globe. Uh, I, I don't see how they could. And again, even if they could, another problem that goes along with the, the lack of ammunition for these weapon systems to fire, because that, that is a problem they cannot solve. And that is something they're not going to be able to replicate next time. It's training. They attempted to build up multiple brigades to, to participate in this offensive that, that we see grinding to a halt right now. And they attempted to train up and build these brigades in entirely too compressed uh, time time frames. It was, it was, there was no way to do it. It would take years to do it. We remember NATO training Ukrainian troops, tens of thousands of them every single year from 2014 up until 2022. That entire force has been wiped out. And if they couldn't do that, in that time frame, there's no way they're going to be able to to do something uh, equal or better in, a, in you know between this offensive and the next one they tried to launch. So it it is the reality of mo modern warfare. This is something they simply cannot do, no matter how much they want to do it. And there is no shortcut around this unless the U.S. and and its allies intervene directly. And that you know there was something else we were talking about before. Uh, before we we started recording, all, all of this talk of Western arms industries uh, building factories in Ukraine, and we were we were wondering how could you do this if Ukraine's arms industry has been completely destroyed, and they have to send what little is left to another country because if they continue operating in Ukraine, it will be destroyed by the Russians. How are they going to build any of these other factories? And the only thing that I could think of, other than it's just being corruption, and they're 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 trying to get money allotted to them for things they know are never going to be built. It's the possibility that again, as and as I've said since the beginning, they might try to create a buffer zone in Western Ukraine that they will then incorporate into NATO, and that they will build these factories. But I want to remind people that the lead time in building factories and then producing the human resources required to run them that takes years and years and years. So. Uh, I, I just don't see how even that is a viable option for Ukraine. Yeah, I don't. I mean, you we have we see basically that you know, uh, Garen two drones or Shahid, whatever you want to call them, uh, basically can go cross country without being intercepted now. So, uh, you know, Ukrainian air defense is so depleted. Any factory that's going to be set up, first off, it's going to take years to build. You don't, you don't, you know, these factories aren't built in a couple days or a couple weeks or even a couple months. They take a long time to build. And then once they are built, they'll just be struck instantly. So I don't really understand how you're planning on getting them into country unless, like you said, they're defended by uh, NATO uh, personnel and equipment somehow through some sort of uh, intervention. It it does seem to me to be a little bit of uh, virtue signaling. Oh, we're going to build yeah. these factories. We're invested in Ukraine. We want this to happen for Ukraine. We want Ukraine to be uh, independent. 
and then eventually join NATO, whatever. I feel like it's just kind of on narrative, on script, uh, because I, there's it doesn't make any sense. It, it just it won't happen. Yeah, and, and the West is struggling to expand their own military industrial production. So if they can't even do that in a timely manner, how are they building entirely new factories in Ukraine? Who's going to work in these factories? It's it's funny. It, it also, just boggles the mind. Yeah, it's funny also to think the Western countries are going to pay for the factory to be built because Ukraine can't pay for it. You, you, the Ukraine is literally on life support from the West. So the, they're going to build factories in Ukraine. They're going to hire Ukrainians to work in these factories. And then they're going to produce munitions on the Western dime that will then be donated to Ukraine for free. It's just like, what? why not just build the factory in your own country if you're going to yes. do all that? And then you'll have it after the war if you end up losing, you know, that just it literally makes zero sense to me. Uh, no, very little of what the West is doing right now regarding Ukraine does make any sense. And that's the scary thing. You have these nuclear armed Western nations who have triggered this proxy war. It is going very badly for them. Uh, are they going to escalate in an unpredictable way or is this going to collapse like Afghanistan did, Vietnam did? Before that, Iraq is still, and, and Syria is still in some sort of uh, frozen state, more or less. Is it going to be like that? I don't know. And uh, again, this is something that we have to continuously keep an eye on. And we, I mean, we saw, it, it's very clear from the Russians how they're thinking. They, you know, Lavrov at the UN, uh, I think it was a Security Council a uh, session basically said we don't mind coming to the table we'll negotiate with ukraine they've made it illegal to negotiate so how are we supposed to negotiate with them when they won't even negotiate obviously 1991 borders that's ridiculous obviously full russian withdrawal is ridiculous that's just uh, that's uh, you know basically saying we we lose you win that's a ridiculous negotiating place so uh we're we're willing to negotiate but we will not uh, implement a ceasefire. That is, we were not going to do that. And I think that's a very, very telling statement. We will not let this become a frozen conflict. We will not let this become a Korea or a Syria or something of that nature. This will, this will either be uh, ended through negotiated settlement or through Russian victory. And I think that that is pretty telling of the confidence that the Russians are feeling right now. Yeah, and I I, I I agree with that sentiment. And I would also like to add that we, we can see how things are going for Russia on the battlefield. We can see what the West is even saying about their growing military potential. And then we look at all of these uh, developments geopolitically that we were just talking about. When you add all of that up and you look at how it's going to be a year from now, do you think it'll be more in Russia's favor or less? Is it going to be more in America's favor in their proxy war or less? And I, I think we can very clearly see the, the trajectory that this is taking. And uh, so, it's, again, Russia has been very patient regarding the U.S. proxy war in Syria. That served Russia very well. They will do the same in Ukraine. And I think that will also serve them very well. It would have been it would have been interesting to if the NATO brigades that were trained up had come in and had performed better. I think it would have been very I think it would have been much more interesting to see how the West would have responded. I think that there would have been a, 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 a lot more focus on getting more men into these Western countries to train and send them off. Obviously, you know, the equipment running out of a, stuff to send is an issue. But I think that one of the major letdowns of this Ukrainian counteroffensive was that these NATO train brigades just did not perform the way that they were expected to perform. Um, and I mean, the 47th Brigade, which was the V Brigade for this offensive, it was the Leopard Bradley Striker Brigade. It was it was the big big brigade uh, has has just been taken off the line of contact because of uh, combat uh, ineffectiveness. I mean, they they've just sustained sustained such high losses in material and manpower that they can't stay on the front line anymore. So if that doesn't give you a sign that this counteroffensive has culminated and likely ended, then I don't know what else would, honestly, at this point. And and if you and I could tell, because we had been talking about this long before the offensive was launched, that it was going to be disastrous for all of these reasons that now the West is admitting. And we, they, they had to have known. 
you have to ask yourself, why did they go ahead and do it anyway? But I guess you could say the same about Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Vietnam, even, uh, you know, a lot of people understood that it was a hopeless case. And 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 the problem is people that understand th these these issues fundamentally and are telling people in Washington and on Wall Street that this is not not viable, but they don't care because they have this this political agenda that they have to push forward. There is no alternative to it. And they don't care if the facts on the ground line up with it or not. So so we've seen this process repeat itself over and over again. And that is a that is a product of this 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 entity that the United States has begun become uh, corrupt, run by special interests who who are obsessed with profit and perpetual expansion. And as as they grow in power and wealth, they become more and more detached from material reality. This is an irony and it's unfortunate and it's repeating itself again in Ukraine. Yeah, and it just it just feels like a dead end. And it, 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 it yes. like a corn, like honestly, like a cornered animal, like, and I, I only, I, I'm hoping that it doesn't get worse. It doesn't yes. aggravate the situation with the, uh, but even the way that the West and Ukraine are communicating with each other, it doesn't seem very good. Like it, the whole tone around the relationship between, you know, Zelensky, Biden, that sort of thing is starting to become worse and worse. You're hearing like the, you know, even the West just saying we need to negotiate when that is against the law by Zelensky's decree basically means that either there's going to have to be some sort of regime change in Ukraine for negotiations to occur or Western support is going to end eventually. Right. And I think that that is, I, yeah, I just I'm hoping that it doesn't escalate in the wrong direction and and become something that it shouldn't. I don't know if it will, though, because I don't know if the Russians will allow the escalation to occur. They, I think that they're just going to, like I said, take the hits as they come and just continue doing what they need to do in Ukraine to secure their version of victory. Yes, I, I agree with that. And I think Again, another irony is that we, we keep hearing about how Russia is invading Ukraine and they want to overthrow the Ukrainian government. But the, the biggest threat to the current Ukrainian government right now is its Western sponsors uh, wanting to most likely get rid of Zelensky or at least get him to do what they want. So what is the point of being a sovereign country if you're beholden to a, a foreign entity you know the, the the reality is that it's U Ukraine is being held hostage and its sovereignty first and foremost subverted by the West, not by Russia. And this started all the way back in 2014, and it's worse than ever right now. And if if anybody's looking for other examples of you know <laughs> proxies not really working out, or you know the the side that the West backs, just look at Venezuela. I mean, you had Juan Guaido, who was the, you know, legitimate president of Venezuela, uh, what, 10 years ago? That was when that was going on, eight years ago, maybe, um, the whole Venezuela nonsense. And then just a couple of weeks ago, we had a picture of one of the U.S. representatives shaking hands with uh, Murdo. So, it, you know, it just, it, it won't last. It's all temporary. Uh, the the rhetoric and everything. As soon as it's not beneficial to the West, they'll they'll switch and they'll make friends with whoever is in power in Ukraine after this is over, and that'll be that. Hopefully, and hopefully, as you know, as, as the U.S. fails in Ukraine, and hopefully, as they realize they have to realize first that they're failing versus China. Hopefully, they'll realize that it's it's their premise that they are starting from in the first place that is fundamentally flawed that needs to be changed this idea that the west is is just somehow entitled to running the the entire planet and everyone on it this is a flawed premise they need to they need to revisit that they need to rework it they need to understand that they are they are part of the rest of the world these are sovereign nations they don't answer to anyone in the west those days are long gone that that was how it went for generations, but those days are long gone now. And if the West wants peace, prosperity, and uh, you know they want to move forward into the future, they're going to have to 
uh, accept this new reality is is not even a it's not even a reality that should be difficult for them to accept. You're you're a nation among other nations. You have your sovereignty; they have their sovereignty. Uh, just just work hard and and enjoy, uh, you know, the benefits of your hard work. Cooperate and trade with others. Why why is that so hard for people in the West running running the West right now? I don't understand. That, that's that a whole another th- conversation that we could have. <laughs> Yeah, it's something that I was thinking about, and I, you, we don't have to get into this, but I was just, well, I, of all of the people who are winning big from this conflict, you know, you can say the military industrial complex in either country, you know, people who are making a lot of money off of it, whatever. But I think one of the biggest geopolitical winners, I, I was, this is just a theory I was kind of c- contemplating the other day, is Lukashenko. I feel like he has been he has come out as the big winner in all of this because his position now in Belarus is so consolidated. He has nukes. He has full Russian uh, backing through the Union State. Uh, He never had to really get involved in Ukraine. Um, He was already sanctioned, so that didn't really matter. I, 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 you know, it's funny to say because he's not really the best politician or anything but it's funny i I was just thinking like wow belarus kind of came out on top on all of this they've only really benefited from this conflict in ukraine i i don't know why i brought that up either even i was just thinking about it but i just thought that was interesting well you know it's it's unfortunate that ukraine could not take a a similar tract and this had to happen Uh, belarus was teetering right on the edge of becoming the next Ukraine. Yep. The same U.S.-sponsored opposition forces were at work in Belarus. I, uh, you know, Again, ironically, they had a, a Nazi element among them waving a World War II-era collaborator flag, just mm-hmm. as the, the Ukrainians had, and they were, able, they were able to put that down and retain sovereignty over Belarus. And you could say, well, doesn't doesn't Russia to a great extent determine what's going on in Belarus? These are countries that border each other and they have a history and they, uh, Belarus had been part of Russia at one point. It is not the same as Washington crossing an entire ocean and, and Western Europe to come in and dictate to the people what type of government they'll have, who is going to run it, what their foreign policy will be and who it will serve which is exactly what the U.S. did to Ukraine and many other countries in Eastern Europe. Uh, unfortunately, Russia was not able to provide Ukraine the same type of protection that Belarus apparently had, or uh, maybe there's other factors involved. It would have been so much better, though, if, if Ukraine went that way rather than the way things went now, where the country has no future right now. Yeah. Do you? I, the, the, yeah, that's... You're you're spot on. I always think, what would the situation look like if all of these countries had acted pragmatically? If Armenia, Georgia, Ukraine, Belarus, I mean, Belarus did act pragmatically. Germany, you know, Germany wouldn't be in a recession right now. They would still be receiving uh, cheap Russian energy. Georgia wouldn't be in the position they're in. Armenia just lost a huge chunk of its territory and 30,000 plus Armenians were forced to relocate out of the uh, territory that was given up back into Armenia. So I just I just always wonder, I, I, I can't believe these countries act against their own pragmatic interests. It's just very difficult for me to wrap my brain around. This this is why the United States has the National Endowment for the, uh, Democracy involved. Their, their whole goal is to cultivate an opposition that will serve Washington's interests at the cost of their own best interests. And I've seen it play out in one country after the other, after the other. There's no one in Armenia who would have done that. The the U.S. had to create an opposition and find someone who would never have gotten into power on their own. They they prop them up. They put them into power. They know these people crave power and will do anything for it. And and so this is this is how they get them to make irrational decisions at the expense of their own country's entire future. I I watched them put together an opposition like that here in Thailand, and they were so eager to just destroy everything Thailand has achieved over centuries, really. Uh, Destroy 
uh, things that Thai people have achieved over centuries and the, the peace and prosperity that they enjoy now, they were ready to just destroy all of it because the, the U.S. built them up. And this is what this is what they had to do in return. They had to commit to these types of policies, cutting Thailand off from China, um, turning themselves into a battering ram against China, yeah. uh, canceling infrastructure projects, uh, dumbing down the education system so that so that Thailand could not be a, a sovereign nation anymore. It would have to be dependent on on uh, the United States. So this it's a process that repeats itself. Ukraine. Uh, didn't manage to to get out of that process. Belarus did. Armenia apparently no. Yeah, and I I just hope that it doesn't continue. I hope that people look at Ukraine and learn a lesson. But I have a hard time thinking that's going to happen, considering yeah. that this has happened multiple times before in the past. But uh, I think that's where we're going to leave it. Uh, thank you, Brian, so much for coming on. Obviously, everybody go check out Brian on, at the New Atlas and make sure you follow him on Telegram as well. He posts all of his videos there. So in case we get deleted off of YouTube, all of Brian's content is right there. Uh, my content is all saved, so I'll be able to re-upload it and I should probably start uploading it other places just in case. But, uh, you know, uh, Brian is a much more uh, diligent uh, YouTuber than I am. So make sure you guys go follow him there and, uh, use him as a source. He is a, uh, incredible, uh, analyst and information, uh, gatherer, I guess I would say. Uh, but other than that, anything else you want to add, Brian? No, just thank, thank you again for having me on. Yeah. And thank you for coming on. Obviously, uh, we, I enjoy doing this with you. I, I believe you enjoy doing this with me. And uh, I want to do a roundtable sometime in the future, get some people on and uh, have you included in that. So sure, be on the lookout for that. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, comment and share, you know, the drill. Uh, and until next time, thank you.